pleased to partner with Esri Canada, a company which provides organizations and local governments with geographic information systems or GIS solutions to assist in formulating key planning decisions. I would like to thank Desmond Kaur for reaching out to PIBC and offering this free one credit webinar to all of our members and our guests today. This webinar briefly highlights current housing affordability initiatives, both at the national and provincial level, and illustrates useful tools and techniques to quantify future planning scenarios and related needs. While we will be using housing as an example in this webinar, the technology I'm told potentially can be applied to other planning areas, such as flood mapping, transportation planning, heritage inventories, and more. And now I would like to introduce our two speakers from Esri Canada. Beginning the webinar will be Lindsay Bedard and concluding the webinar will be Dan Campbell. Welcome Lindsay and welcome Dan. Nice to have you aboard. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so just as a quick uh, housekeeping item, we encourage you to use the chat for questions. You can also use the chat to inform us of any technical issues that arise or for general comments and feedback. Ensure that you have selected the correct recipient from the to drop down menu and we'll take questions at the end time permitting, but please feel free to drop your questions in the chat at any time. And as Sophie mentioned, we are recording today and we'll make um, the recording and our slide deck, uh, which includes resources and references available to you after the presentation. As Sophie mentioned, I'm Lindsay Bedard. I work for Esri Canada. I am a consultant with the ArcGIS Urban Team. I'm also a landscape architect. Um, I'm a member of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects and the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects. And uh, I'm Dan Campbell. Um, my background is in architecture, and uh, I too joined Esri Canada last year. And uh, prior to that, I was at the City of Vancouver for a very long time in both the planning and GIS departments. Thanks, Dan. So we'll actually start our presentation today with a poll question. <laughs> So the first question that we're going to ask, in your organization, where does tackling housing affordability rank in priority? Is it the number one priority? Does it rank as one of the most important issues? Is it not a priority item? Or are you unsure? We'll leave this question open for about another 30 seconds or so. Give everyone a chance to answer it. Great. Great, we got lots of responses. It seems like um, a lot of you say that it's um, a high priority for you. It's either um, a top priority or one of the most important issues or one of the more important issues, I should say. So thanks everyone for, for that. For our presentation today, we will give a high level overview of housing affordability. We will discuss some initiatives at the national level and specific to British Columbia. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we will not discuss any initiatives in the Yukon during today's presentation. For the initiatives we discuss, we will outline some of their targets and strategies and then discuss how planners can work towards sustainable and equitable communities. We will then discuss an Esri Inc. workflow developed to outline the key steps to analyze and plan for equity and inclusion. Finally, we will use ArcGIS Urban to demonstrate how we quantify future plan scenarios for target metrics, such as maximum number of affordable housing units, number of residential units with a specific number of bedrooms, minimum outdoor um, amenity space requirements, and we'll demonstrate how we can customize what metrics we will display so we can gather information about future planning areas. 
Housing affordability is a pressing issue in all regions of Canada. Furthermore, vulnerable populations may face additional barriers to accessing affordable and equitable housing. The current social housing stock is rapidly aging and the need for new community housing is common knowledge among professionals and the public. The housing spectrum or housing continuum as it's also often referred, outlines the types of housing accommodations. Homelessness and emergency shelters are living situations in which we want to get people out of and into at the very least transitional housing, but preferably a more permanent affordable housing situation, which could be supportive housing, social housing, affordable rentals, affordable ownership, any, anything that's just more permanent. Um, in the housing spectrum, uh, BC Housing uh, defines market rent as a rent amount that is generally similar to the rent of other units in the private non-subsidized housing market. We're going to use the term afford affordable housing somewhat generally during this presentation, unless of course we're specifying um, a specific program. The important considerations for us in this discussion is that affordable housing meets the needs of the individual or household, it's financially viable, and that it's suitable and safe for comfortable habitation. So what is affordable housing? The widely accepted definition for income-based or needs-based housing is that housing is considered affordable if it costs less than 30% of your before-tax household income. Housing is a more general term, um, whereas individuals or households um, are identified specifically for core housing needs. So people or families whose income is too low to be able to pay for a unit of appropriate size in their community are often described as being in core housing need. If a person or household chooses to spend more and has an income that is sufficient to afford the rent for an alternative unit in the local housing market, then this is not considered to be in core housing need. According to Statistics Canada, in British Columbia in 2016, it is estimated that over 260,000 households, a provincial rate of 14.9%, were in core housing need. In Yukon, over 2,100 households, or rate of 15.2%, were in core housing need. Um, in 2018, according to Statistics Canada, approximately 11.6% of Canadian households were in core housing need. Um, additionally, according to the CMHC, core housing need is almost entirely a problem faced by those with low incomes. In 2016, 80% of Canadian households in core housing need were at the bottom 20% of household incomes, and almost all of them, 98%, um, were in the bottom 40% of household incomes. The 30% rule for affordable housing may be appropriate to find somewhere to live or um, uh, like for some people, especially for people with higher incomes and therefore more options. But the reality of housing affordability for an individual situation is based on many other factors. These factors may include location, so how much you pay for transportation, car insurance, gas, parking if you don't have access to transit, or you might need to pay more to find a suitable home with access to transit if you don't have a car or don't drive, um, and the distance for you or others in your household to get to work or other, or other things like school. So, all, so location can affect a lot of things. Um, and not just the, the price of the house in, in that location. Also the home type, age and condition will all influence how much you might spend on utilities and maintenance if you own. There's also things like strata fees um, or your personal financial circumstances. So if for instance, you're um, financially responsible for a dependent um, at this point in your life. So this list of barriers to access is by no means a comprehensive list. Household income, life circumstances, and belonging to a marginalized group are some systemic barriers to affordable housing access. There are social and cultural biases that put certain individuals or groups at a disadvantage to access suitable housing. 
Then there are several barriers on this list, however, that pertain more closely to things like policy and administration. Um, and these may include the process of get, getting development permits approved um, and coordinating different policies associated with different levels or entities of government. So if you're a developer, um, it may not, there may not be the incentive to go through that um, regulatory process for affordable housing. Um, there's also the availability of suitable affordable housing and the availability of skilled labor to build and maintain um, affordable housing. And there's also a disparity between public assistance amounts and actual market rent costs. And these are all challenges that create barriers to access. Certain examples on this list um, that actually reinforce some of the barriers that vulnerable populations already face. So these could include the program application process, which may be difficult to navigate or understand, inaccessible processes for reporting unsuitable conditions and complaint resolution, and a lack of support for those with substance use disorders or mental health issues. of Canada's social housing stock was built between 1946 and 1993. In 2016, the federal government provided $1.7 billion in support to over 536,000 households living in social housing. Um, so the CMHC administers about 20% of social housing agreements and provinces and territories administer the other 80%. In 2017, the national housing strategy was announced. The vision of the national housing strategy is that all Canadians have access to affordable housing that meets their needs. Their vision statement goes on to say that affordable housing is a cornerstone of sustainable, inclusive communities and a Canadian economy where we can prosper and thrive. The national housing strategy is a 10-year strategy with over $70 billion promised in investments to build stronger communities across the country, helping Canadians and newcomers access safe and affordable homes. So these are the um, priority areas uh, for action in uh, Canada's national housing strategy. For purposes of this presentation, we will really only touch on number one and number five. These are all important areas for action and these action items are interrelated in many ways. So we do encourage you to read about the strategy in its entirety if this topic is of interest to you. According to the CMHC, housing need is deepest and most prevalent in groups of Canadians that have historically been marginalized and disadvantaged. Women, Indigenous peoples, seniors, people with disabilities, and racialized people are all more likely to experience housing need than the average Canadian. Additionally, according to a 2018 study by the CMHC, people with disabilities are much more likely to be in core housing need than the general population. The sustainable housing and communities area focus is based upon ensuring that future affordable community housing use uh, future affordable community housing uses materials, design, and construction methods that are durable, environmentally friendly, socially inclusive, and financially secure for builders and operators. Minimizing ongoing maintenance and operational inputs is sustainable for the environment and the economy. Social, sustainable, social sustainability is important for building vibrant communities that are socially inclusive. Social inclusion is a process of improving the ability, opportunity, and dignity of those disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. Social sustainability is when individuals have the resources and opportunities to be involved in society to an extent that is satisfactory to them. It's important that the supply of affordable housing is diverse and meets residents' needs and is equitable, inclusive, and socially sustainable. Vulnerable populations should be engaged um, in a meaningful way. Affordable housing should be accessible, have supportive services, be located close to amenities, transit, active transportation, and employment be close to social, cultural, and recreational amenities, as well as suitable green space, 
be located in mixed tenure or mixed use developments, just to name a few things. Generally speaking, the goal is to build vibrant and inclusive communities where people want to live and work in complete communities with all the amenities. So time for another poll question. And we, for this one, we encourage you to select any and all that apply. <clears throat> for this question, we're asking what industry developments are needed to better address housing affordability? Or new residential land development, more land gentrification and adaptive reuse, government or bank intervention for buyers, or an increase to household income. Leave this open for another 30 seconds or so. All right, maybe we'll leave it open for another 10 seconds. Oh, we'll close it. So it looks like um, it's pretty much spread equally between all four options. It seems like, um, yeah, uh, most people agree that um, any of these things could, um, could uh, better address housing affordability. So thank you everyone for your answers. So we'll now discuss some initiatives and programs in British Columbia that help address housing affordability. In 2018, the Homes for BC 30 point plan for housing affordability in British Columbia was released. It outlines over $7 billion in investments over 10 years towards affordable housing to support the delivery of 114,000 new, new affordable housing units. This is underway in partnership with all levels of government, Indigenous peoples, non, not for profits, and the private sector. In addition to building new homes for those in need, the plan outlines other measures to help achieve targets and community sustainability. This includes support for transit services, tax reforms, improving rental assistance programs, and broadening eligibility criteria for rental assistance programs. Also outlined in this plan is $1.1 billion for upgrades and repairs to affordable housing. The Homes for BC plan specifically outlines how over $6 billion in funding will be distributed to over 30,000 new units to address affordable housing for populations in need. This includes transitional housing for women and children fleeing domestic violence, Indigenous housing, and community housing. In our can work to achieve targets is certainly easier said than done. But we have tried to outline some strategies that planners can use within their organizations to at least start discussions. One option may be to reject proposals that don't meet requirements, um, minimum uh, affordable housing requirements, um, and rejecting cash in lieu or um, implementing penalties for not meeting target requirements. Sure, every major city experiences a developer removing the affordable housing units after public consultation, um, but imposing additional penalties for this may be necessary if your uh, city is in need of affordable housing. Moving regulatory barriers will help reduce the time and cost of building. This could include a uh, rapid processing of affordable housing developments. When identifying suitable lands for development, Ensure that access to services and amenities is equitable and also that housing is distributed throughout your city, town, municipality to ensure that residents can live or continue to live uh, close to work, school, or community services they rely upon. Reviewing policies and bylaws that may restrict or hinder infill opportunities or other affordable development opportunities. Identify ways you and your organization can support members of your community access services. This could be a matter of subsidizing or even relocating certain services. Meaningful engagement of underrepresented groups such as those facing homelessness. 
This could require third party organizations who work closely with these groups take the lead on how to best engage. And although we have discussed a lot about creating new affordable housing, it's also important to identify and preserve existing affordable housing. And Dan will discuss this topic in further detail um, during his presentation. So now we'll start to introduce you to how we quantify plans using ArcGIS Urban. So here we have um, a scenario um, in which we have um, uh, We've worked towards achieving um, the affordable and market value uh, residential unit targets for this city, um, and also the required amenity green space for this city. Um, this example, this scenario here doesn't quite meet the green space targets. Um, so we developed another scenario that looks at maybe a little bit of additional height and a little more uh, green space, so less coverage, but still meeting the targets for um, their affordable and market value units. This logic flowchart for how we might create a dashboard like the one we shown in the previous slide. We assume the target distribution of one bedroom unit types is 25% of total development, two bedroom units at 50%, and three bedroom units at 25% for this particular region. Then we looked at the average unit sizes for one, two, and three bedroom units for the region to get overall counts of each unit type. Then we looked at the city's targets for affordable housing, which in this instance was 20% affordable and 80% market value. Then we then assigned these uh, percentage distributions to each of those unit types to get the count for the number of affordable and market value one, two, and three bedroom units in a development or an area where multiple multifamily developments might be possible based upon current or proposed zoning regulations. The key components of this was that we were looking at target distributions of one, two, and three bedroom units in a typical multifamily residential building and the associated unit sizes, and then determining the number of units of each type for market and affordable housing based on a target, target percentage distribution of units. So rather than assuming that the affordable housing units would have a smaller relative size compared to a market value unit with the same number of bedrooms, we assume they would have a similar unit size based on the regional averages for specific unit types. Additionally, this ensures that the distribution of housing unit types is equitably distributed. So rather than making only affordable one bedroom units, there is a distribution among amongst the unit types based on typical distribution in the region and uh, current needs for different unit types. One thing we didn't show here, but would certainly be worthwhile to integrate, would be um, luxury units in such a flowchart diagram. So luxury units would likely have a larger floor area and possibly some additional in-suite amenities, which would make them pricier than the average market value property. This would be appropriate to include this type of logic diagram because it's also important to provide choice for those who have the income and, and um, provide a diversity of housing options. I will now hand over the presentation to Dan. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, I'm going to start out by acknowledging that I am old. This is some work I did in the 1980s for the Arbutus Industrial Lands, looking at massing and housing capacity. It's actually the same area that I'll be using for the demo. The ways of addressing housing and development are forever evolving, and I want to touch on just how the processes and tools have changed. In this diagram, which I wish I had more time to go into detail, it actually shows the evolution of the different workflows going back from the pure analog to where we are now in, into the, the realm of holistic design. What I really want to emphasize is that the trend has been towards more and more intelligent data and an all-encompassing approach where metrics become an inherent part of the 3D model. This is pretty much where we are at now in the GIS CAD integration, smart design, parametric design role uh, of, uh, in the process. 
And I guess what I want to emphasize about how this is changing is there's been a kind of a democratization of analysis tools and that you don't need robust 3D skills to do the work, nor do you need to be a GIS expert. Standard planning staff can tackle this without any difficulty. And the other thing is, like the shark, if we keep, if we, if we stop moving, we die. In this case, we, we have to keep moving and evolving to the, the changing workflows and expectations of the public of what we can actually deliver. Right now, a lot of the work we do when we do this kind of housing analysis is very much a disconnected process. We may start out with some GIS applications to try to assemble the contextual data. And then we'll probably have to dig through PDF and Word documents to get the zoning information we actually need because in most GIS systems, the critical information about setbacks, height, FSR, FAR is not captured in their files. Then we need a SketchUp, a Rhino, an AutoCAD to actually do the 3D massing analysis to build the buildings out. And then finally, something like an Excel, a spreadsheet to actually coordinate and pull in all this information that you're actually getting from the creating the, the buildings and the 3D application. The real problem, of course, is none of these are connected. If you suddenly need to add three stories to your model, you have to make sure that you're actually updating that three stories in the spreadsheet and vice versa. Changes there are not in sync either. And while this kind of approach is viable if you're only dealing with one to three parcels at a larger study area or a neighborhood scale, it's simply not sustainable. And trying to track that much information is going to lead to errors. I guess one thing I have to make clear about ArcGIS Urban, it, it is a web application. And while desktop tools like ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS City Engine can play a role in the process, the emphasis is on working within and with data from ArcGIS Online. So I want to go through the kind of core ingredients that one needs to work with in ArcGIS Urban to do the kind of analysis that we're talking about. We start with the, the parcel fabric itself, and we need to be able to edit that uh, fabric to merge and split parcels and to be able to do it in a non-destructive way. We always need to be able to go back, look at existing conditions and compare them to the, the different states that we may be creating as part of the scenario. And then we have to add in the zoning types. These are the basic regulatory information about height, FAR, the setbacks, the tiers, uh, what kind of setbacks are uh, integrated at different levels in the actual building. Once we've got that volumetric expression of that uh, outer shell, we then have to create what are called building types. And this is just the generic massing of the buildings. So for example, what you see here is a, a, a pure residential building with a, a residential podium and a residential tower. And within, within urban, you can specify how many, what range of stories would be in the podium and what range of stories would be in the actual tower structure. And finally, uh, it's the space use types. And this is where we put in additional information. So for instance, if we're putting in some residential use, uses, what is the net area factor? How much of that actual area that we're drawing in 3D is going to be livable space and how much is corridors, um, elevator shafts, uh, mechanical areas? As well, we need to be able to specify floor to floor heights. And this could be very general or very specific depending on your need. For instance, the, in the commercial uh, representation you see here in red, we're using five meter floor to floor heights and three meters for the residential. And what is actually attached to these space uses, uh, either generated from the gross building area you generate or through parameters that you actually define are the actual metrics themselves. So this is where you begin to track as you build uh, out your 3D models, how, does the, how is the household changing? How's the population changing? What's the percentage of non-market units, parking, CO2 emissions, is, and on and on. It's really what you need to define to meet your... Uh, 
actually, in this whole process, I would say the most difficult step is actually assembling existing condition data. And while you're likely to have the core data that you need, uh, like your zoning polygons, your parcel fabrics, and you'll need to define your own space use and building types, getting that core uh, metrics about existing population, households, and jobs can be a, a bit of work. Uh, while the information is certainly available through Stats Canada, if, through dissemination areas, you want to and you need to be able to work at this at the smaller scale of the at individual parcel level. So you need to disaggregate this data down to the parcel level. And this is available through other sources through third parties, such as Esri Geo Enrichment or Environics. And of course, you can certainly take advantage of what others are doing. There is a substantial amount of data available online, ArcGIS online, OpenStreetMap, 3D Warehouse, all the slew of open data sites. But at the same time, I know I've been very guilty pulling in 3D models of buildings to do analysis. And I start to put it in my model. And that's when I hear my mother's voice say, put that back, you don't know where it's been. How good is that data? What's its provenance? How current is it? All that is really critical to know if you're going to do analysis that's going to uh, substantially change uh, the fabric of your city. Actually, being able to create the existing 3D built form is a little easier. If you have access to LIDAR, what you can use, as we're showing here, is something like Esri's 3D base map solution, which is a guided step-by-step -step tool to convert LIDAR to um, level of detail two or level of detail one buildings and trees, as you see here. And that leads us into the first poll question in my segment. In your organization, the data necessary for housing analysis is A, fully available, B, available, but not to the level of detail needed. For example, do you know the number of bedrooms in the existing uh, building in, in your city? C, mostly available for recent developments, but we lack historical data. And D, not readily available, and we struggle to assemble what we need. Please give us your answers. I'm really curious to see this because my sense is that most people don't have access to the data. We'll see if I'm right. And the answer is <laughs> fully available, not surprising, yep. <laughs> It's nice for once in my life to be proven correct. Okay, uh, what actually we're gonna look at now is kind of the initial overview screen in ArcGIS Urban. And I think this is really important because there's a danger when you're working on a, a housing project or any other kind of planning project to zoom into the area of interest and kind of avoid everything else. Something like Urban provides a full context at all times. So you can see what, what projects, and projects are sort of short-term related to development permits. What's, what's being processed now? How could it potentially uh, affect uh, what I'm doing? And the colors show different states, prelim, uh, in process, et cetera. The orange icons are actually showing the individual plans. And in the dropdown, we can get a description of the plan and um, open them as required. But the interesting component is the indicators. Indicators are essentially 3D um, web scenes that you bring in for additional contextual information. So I'm gonna open up first uh, cultural facilities and I've themed this to actually represent the actually capacity and size of each of the facilities. And we have the full access to whatever data is in there to provide us, help us in the decision-making process. So information about uh, number of seats, uh, for overall size of the building, and as well, I think relevant to a lot of places these days, bring in something like um, sea level rise floodplain analysis. So we can pull that in, see uh, how that would actually impact uh, our area of development and determine what kind of remediation or change of building form would be necessary to address it. 
within the overview itself as well, you have access to additional data as required. For instance, if you get to an individual parcel, you can actually click on that and that pulls up all the uh, relevant zoning information, just what the zoning is, what the parcel area is, as, long as, as well as some basic regulatory information such as maximum height and maximum FAR. You can actually control um, the daylighting of your scene and actually uh, set up uh, animations to actually see the shadows over the course of 24 hours, or if you wish, uh, over the full year period, just to get an impact immediately of what, in, what your existing building will actually cause. One of the easiest ways to, uh, to get a generalized sense of available capacity is to display the zoning envelopes along with existing buildings. This can only visualize the volumetric aspects of the zoning and not the actual FAR, but it does provide a quick and easy ballpark representation of potential capacity. A more accurate approach would be to generate built form based on existing zoning using a limited set of representative building types. This will provide metrics on the maximum possible population and households based on the zoning. Other regulations that might limit the capacity but not in the zoning such as view constraints can be incorporated as overlay layers to ensure more accurate calculations. Now I'm going to show you the a, a tool to very quickly determine what are the most appropriate sites to develop based on a range of criteria. This is the parcel suitability tool. So within my um, existing plan area that I've digitized here, I can then actually select either an individual criteria or a range of criteria. Uh, here we're looking at everything from seismic risk to age of construction, distance to parks, flood risk, it's just a question of determining what, what is the criteria that is best used to determine um, suitability. So in this one, we're going to choose, uh, let me see, what would be age of construction, distance to parks, size of existing households and parcel size. And using the sliders to the right, I can actually adjust the weighting. So if I actually feel that seismic risk is more important than households, I can use that. I then calculate the scores and it actually creates um, a thematic map um, with actual quantified scores for each of the individual parcels. So if I click on an individual parcel, I get each of the scores uh, based on the individual criteria. For instance, this one shows age of construction gets a score of two, distance to parks it's nearby gets a score of 10. And that, that ensures that I get a quick analysis to provide a good selection to work with. Okay, now we're actually going to go in and develop a site, uh, sort of step by step, provide a new building type and actually see the resulting metrics. So in this case, uh, we're gonna check, take this corner site and develop it with a very basic uh, six story apartment building. So first of all, we'll look at the existing conditions just to see what its metrics are in terms of population, households, and jobs. Uh, probably the 10 jobs there are work from home situation. But we'll go to scenario one, select the parcel, and then actually select from our list of building types we've assembled a six-story apartment. And it generates it up. Uh, as predicted with the six stories. And we can look at the regulatory information to make sure, yes, we're within the um, maximum height limit and we're dead on with the FAR. So it's, it's a good representation. As we move into actually looking at the, um, the metrics, the actual population of households haven't changed dramatically, which is not surprising because this new building form is actually quite similar to the existing building form. But what we now have exposed, as Lindsay was mentioning earlier, all this detailed information uh, breakdown of the different number of um, bedrooms per unit and what the, the, the allocation of the different uh, market or non-market uh, units within the building. 
So let's actually go ahead now and actually change to a different building type. And this is kind of the power of urban to quickly do these testing. Here we actually do a tower and it's actually working with, uh, the, it's showing us the same floor area ratio and it's within the height. And because nothing is, else has changed, the resulting metrics are going to be pretty much the same as we saw with the other building form. We're just having some, a different way of actually addressing the contextual constraints. But let's push it a bit further. Let's go to a 25 story tower in this case and see what happens. Well, we've done it, but it doesn't look much different. It's still at an FAR of 2.75, and the, but you, you see it's gone up to the full 42 uh, meter height limit. And we're not gonna get the 25 stories until we actually do some changes uh, to, to that actual height to allow us to actually achieve that full, um, full desired building form. So this is where we can actually go into overrides and overrides are really useful in doing quick what if kind of testing. So we select the parcel and what we'll actually change here is both the height and the floor area ratio. So we know we want to have something higher to get the 25 stories. So we'll go to 70 meters and we'll push the FAR up to four, go back to our development tab and actually then reapply that same building type and now we actually have a much taller building and obviously the now the FAR is up to 4.0. We still are not achieving the full um, 25 stories because the height limit is kicked in and we can't get a building that's more than 69 meters in this case. So now that we have this, and I think this is one of the real powers is that we don't have to wait until we've done this, all the, the original kind of developing the massing to do some uh, contextual analysis. This kind of analysis can be done concurrently to really test what you're doing as you develop to allow you to iterate in an efficient and quick manner. So let's, uh, let's see what we're going to do here. We're going to... Um, go into our analysis tool and actually go to our shadow cast analysis. And we're looking at a time period between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And what we actually want to see here is what areas are actually in shadow for more than two hours of threshold at, is displayed here. Or we can actually show what's the total shadow duration for that same time period from um, 10 to four. And it can be done hourly. And what's really interesting is then we can go in and click on individual points in the site and find out how long that actual spot is in shadow. So one hour and 15 minutes in this case. Really useful to then, you might need to readjust your tower location to address that. As well, I'm pulling in some external data sources. Uh, this is from a UBC student. I'm looking at dwelling cost in Vancouver, monthly rental costs in Vancouver, or percent income spent on housing. I can actually then just sort of see, is this tower even in the right spot given these constraints? Am I going to actually force out some affordable housing to achieve this wonderful 25 story tower? Once we have the tower in place, then we can do a lot more with the actual edit spaces functionality. This allows me to actually go in and select all the individual components of this generated plausible building and change both the um, shape and form of them and the actual use. So I'm gonna select the podium and I could move the edges, I can edit the vertices and I can actually rotate the entire form as necessary. This case, I'm just going to deal with the moving the edges and I want to move the entire podium closer to the intersection. And uh, I'll actually do the same thing with the tower. And while I'm making these adjustments, the actual FAR and uh, metrics are being updated on the fly as well. So let's uh, get a smaller floor plate here and see how it looks. And then we'll go down and actually check what is happening with our numeric response. Uh, we're under the floor area ratio now and we're okay for height. But what, what we can also do at this point is do a little bit of sculpting of the building to make it uh, less uh, schematic and more representational of a potentially of an actual building form. 
And once again, as I'm doing that, you can see the floor area ratio is going down. And now what I want to do is actually change the two lower podium levels to a commercial use. And in doing so, the height of the building is actually changing now as well because the floor to floor height is now five meters for the podium rather than three. And once again, everything gets adjusted accordingly. And as you see the little dot next to the height, Urban is actually warning me that this new proposal is exceeding the maximum height. And uh, I'm going to probably have to ask for some kind of relaxation to get this building approved, but it's so lovely. I have no, no doubt that that will happen. Uh, I just quickly also mention that while I'm showing you this on a single parcel, this can also be done at a large area all at once. So I can actually select this entire study area and then use the apply multiple building types functionality. Here I can actually select from the kind of palette of buildings I've been working with and uh, define the target allocation that I want to be um, put into the plan area. So right now I've done 20% for all of them and also leaving 20% of the buildings on, on, unchanged. And that's actually then brings up uh, a, a complete uh, development scenario, which I can then check for my metrics and adherence to the zoning. Okay, another poll question. What are your top challenges or needs? Integrating data into other plans into my design, designing with environmental context, designing and presenting plans in a single view, receiving and recording feedback from consultation, and planning for climate change adaptation. Vote away, please. Now, this one, I have no idea where the weighting of the responses are going to be. I'm, I'm going with receiving and recording feedback from consultation. I'll see if I'm right this time. No, integrating data and other plans into my design. Actually, I'm very happy with that response. And one thing also about Urban being a web-based tool means that it opens up a, a lot of potential for engagement through the web. And one of the challenges we know in terms of uh, public engagement pro pro processes is, is getting people out to the meetings. And someone holding down two jobs will find it difficult to make a Tuesday evening meeting. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that web-based engagement has its own issues with equitable access. But there is the potential of actually sharing out the full urban model or sharing out uh, plans, and they can be actually shared out as web scenes as well or integrated into story maps, a wide range of potential for engagement. And it actually has a, a built-in discussion functionality so that with your, your, your internal team or your um, planning committee, they have the possibility of going into the model, noting comments about issues, uh, items they want have changed, and you can moderate this note and track the responses. And I want to finish up by quickly talking about the ability to sort of go beyond ArcGIS Urban into visualization, because we know that the public expects more uh, than just schematic views of what we're planning. They want to have a, a sense of what actually is possible. And through the integration with our ArcGIS City Engine and these new game engines, there's a lot of potential here. So in this case, I've taken my urban scenario, synced it into City Engine, done some enhancement using the complete streets to create a more um, representational streetscape and then integrate it into the model. And so here's the uh, streetscape in um, urban. And then here's this, that same uh, scenario visualized within City Engine with a little more fidelity. 
And here's a, yet the same one, no additional work taken into one of the game engines, and uh, the, in this case, NVIDIA Omniverse, and the kind of photo real representation. Once again, the, here it is in the new Unreal Engine 5, just striking uh, visuals. And I recognize that, in, especially in a municipal environment, we want to do all these, we just don't have the time or the resources. And anything that makes it sort of step-by-step -step and easy makes it more viable. And now I can actually take my urban scenario into City Engine and create this kind of viewpoint driven uh, VR representation that can either be viewed in VR or uh, in just a web page to navigate view through the different viewpoints of the scenario. And finally, uh, the ability to actually now is just one step save uh, an urban scenario through City Engine into the new um, Omniverse XR environment and have totally navigatable um, VR experience. And we have one final uh, poll question. Which of these capabilities are critical to your design and planning work? A, more data, demographics, growth areas, digital zoning, et cetera, better methods for analyzing and impacting modeling, improved visualization of plans, easier integration of historical land and zoning information, and finally, more consultation with the public. Vote away, please. My vote is for improved visualization of plans, but I'm very biased. Oh, it's a close tie with demographic growth areas and digital zoning and impact modeling. Well, good. And that include that finalizes our uh, presentation. So we have a little bit of time for some questions. Dan, perhaps yes. I can help by moderating the questions. If I could Certainly. ask Lindsay to come back on, turn on her uh, webcam and her mic. Thanks, Sophie. So, yeah, so we have a few minutes. Um, we'll quickly go through a couple of questions. The first one, uh, going back to your presentation, Lindsay, you were talking about a scenario for affordable uh, units, and someone is asking about what the definition is that you used for this particular example. Sorry, I put myself back on mute. Um, that's a really great question. Um, so in this instance, affordable units were defined as units below market value rent or um, price for a comparable unit in the area. Um, we also incorporated a target distribution, assuming a maximum of 20% of units would be affordable based on community planning initiatives. However, this distribution could be adjusted. Thank you. Dan, a question for you. Can you model contours for sloped sites? Not directly in urban. And this is where you would use the kind of indicators or context uh, role of urban so that you would do it in say ArcGIS Pro and you'd be able to bring that in as a reference, uh, essentially a reference layer. Okay. Um, another question for Dan, in the site specific scenarios or neighborhood scale, can you tinker with the parcel fabric? I'm not sure what Sean means by that. Perhaps yes, you yes. Uh, I, I think I know what he means is that yeah. And yes, yeah, so I can actually um, say select three parcels and merge them together as a new development parcel. And it will, uh, if, it's, if it's in the existing zone, it will inherit that zone for the new parcels. If it's in a if it's a if it's at an area that's between two zones that you have to sort of choose which one to use, and the same way you can there's tools for going in and actually dividing larger parcels into something that is easier to develop, and there's even a tool that will say allow you to draw a line through a parcel and def, you can define in advance what the right of way width you would like and it will create a right of way for a potential uh, road alignment. Mm -hmm. Great. How is heritage identified, evaluated, and managed? I know uh, for some of the smaller communities, they don't have the resources to do a heritage inventory. So how can we help them? 
Well, that's dumped down. Yeah, well, I have. I know I have done some work with urban where what you really wanted to do was pr protect urban uh, or protect heritage sites from redevelopment or note that 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 is there. And once again, that's usually the the case where you would bring in that existing information that could either be attached to the parcels as a, um, a kind of a metric or bring what I've done in the past as well is just actually brought them in as uh, 3D symbols. So that I actually know uh, and do a theming on perhaps categories of the heritage designation to actually recognize that that, that heritage designation exists at that site. That's the extent of my experience with it so far. Okay. Um, planners are generally interested in uh, social equity or, or social justice. So the next question uh, relates to that. A social lens would be interesting given the impact of redeveloping older housing, which is generally more affordable. Where do tenants go when vacancy rates are already extremely low? Yeah, other than as I sort of mentioned in my um, presentation, it's really interesting that it, urban to a certain extent exposes when you're doing the new development, potentially what is being lost as well. Be because if you have some pretty robust existing condition metrics, then you can actually see uh, the change between the two. And is, it, is, is, it, is this necessarily a good idea? The, um, when I did some work at, at the city of Vancouver, when we were looking at the um, housing, uh, what was kind of a surprise is that, yeah, it was really easy to achieve the number of targets with a taller tower, but we, what we didn't anticipate sometimes was, wow, that's an awful lot of commercial uses that were being lost. So trying to keep the track of the, what's being gained and what's being lost any time and, and the scenario, being able to create different scenarios for that certainly helps as well. Okay, thank you. And one final question um, relating to contours again. Uh, would it be possible to see the 3D elevated ground surface of the scene? I know you've showed us all the examples as being flat. Oh, oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, by default, Urban uses Esri's um, elevation surface, which is pretty good in most cases. But what I have found is that if it's an area with pretty extreme slopes, ideally what you would do is uh, use that same 3D base map solution we mentioned to actually create a new uh, custom 3D um, elevation layer for your uh, individual area. And that, that ensures things like uh, that buildings better fit on the topography as well. Mm, okay. Uh, I think we'll, we'll conclude there. Thank you again to Lindsay Bedard and Dan Campbell for presenting today. As Lindsay mentioned, due to uh, time constraints, we were not able to go into more detail about um, any more detail in any particular region. But if there is interest, we can follow up with a two hour workshop sometime in the new year, or even gear a workshop for a specific area like Yukon. Uh, please let me know if you are interested. You can email me at sophie.king at pibc.bc.ca. As noted earlier, we will be sending the webinar recording and the slide presentation to everyone for PIBC members. Please remember to claim 1.5, sorry, one organized structured CPL unit. Um, thank you again to Esri Canada for reaching out um, and to the two speakers, Lindsay Bedard and Dan Campbell. And very quickly before we go, we are in the process of finalizing our fall webinar program. Please save the dates for the following webinars. September 28th, we will be exploring reconciliation through placemaking. October 26th, we will be offering a webinar on practical skills for planners. We all need that. And on November 30th, we will be partnering with Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation and other organizations, both public and private, to explore models of missing middle housing. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you again for watching and thank you to our speakers and bye for now.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.